Yeah. <laughs> Needed to flip it twice again and then. All right. Thank you, Benzo. I mean, that was nearly invisible, right? But uh, this thing opened automatically without me typing anything. Just uh, put in the USB pen drive, and it's not hard to imagine that this could do something worse than opening our presentation. So there was a very simple demonstration of the, well, dangers involved when dealing with USB, which you may not have thought of before. Sorry, Molly, do you want to do the oh, yeah, introduction sure. thing? Still? Uh, this is a USB board attacks and usable defense mechanisms by Ludwig and Anittis and Toby Mueller. So we're looking at the coolest and most powerful USB device that has ever existed. Right. <clears throat> so this is, um, I mean, fairly innocent because I, I bet some of you have dealt with USB and, you know, other people's USB keys and turns out that people do plug in USB keys into their computers because that's what people do. There's academic research about, you know, people, the behavior of people and, well, turns out they just plug anything in, right? And as we've seen, that's dangerous. And uh, we're here to talk about how that works and uh, how we think we can, well, reduce the attack surface and protect our users a bit better. So let's quickly talk about USB and what USB is, and let's hope that the autoplay works. Oh, it doesn't. Fair enough. So this is a spot from Intel from a couple of years back, and it shows like this rock star guy, he's that uh, Indian dude from Intel who it sort of invented USB, co-invented USB with all the others, and uh, you know, it's been a massive success. Arguably USB is a very famous interfacing protocol. It has replaced the serial, manually configured serial interface from like 20 years back. Anybody of my age will remember that connecting a joystick to a computer was a massive pain. These days you just need to plug in USB and it just works, right? That's, uh, that's fairly good, that's an achievement. And um, USB was meant to be cheap, so that's the reason why you need to you know, flip it twice again in order for it to work. It, on the first try it doesn't, it doesn't work, on the second it doesn't, and then on the third time it finally works. That's uh, because, well it was by design, because it was cheaper, it saved a few cents to like, have, have it unidirectional rather than bidirectional, because they did want to make it as cheap as possible, and arguably that has led to USB success. So you find USB everywhere. You know, you find it in planes, you find it in elections. This is from my hometown in Germany, Hamburg, where they uh, try to, well, do elections with this electrical pen, and it's got this sort of camera on the top, so it would notice where you've put your cross, you know, based on, well, where you've, based, where you've put your cross. And uh, the election people would then read this pen out after elections and you know, there's, there's USB there, like not only arguably safety critical in planes, but, only, uh, but also, you know, mission critical for our basic demo democratic infrastructure in form of elections. And um, what's the actual problem with the USB? Well, it's up to the USB device to claim their identity or capabilities. So you have this innocently looking pen drive, and I mean, this is, if, it, if this had a better casing, then it would look nothing, it would look exactly like any regular, you know, pen drive that you use day to day. And um, yet the device can tell the operating system whatever it wants to be. It can identify as whatever it wants. Brilliant. That's the future. The future is now. And um, it does that by way of uh, descriptors. So the, there's a hierarchy of, well, identifications that a, or identities that a, that a device can claim. And at the very bottom, these endpoints, this you can think of as sort of ports. Like if you're thinking in network-based services, then this would be a port. So this is where you where you send uh, data to. Like uh, if if there, if it was a keyboard, it probably had one endpoint for you know the key that's currently being pressed, and you could interact with this endpoint and get the currently key pressed currently pressed key. If it was a say. Uh, like a mass storage device, then it would have another endpoint which would represent the well, actual hard disk drive or like where you send your bulk data to for it to be persisted on disk. 
And there's, um, there's a hierarchy involved, so you can switch configurations like a device. You can put a device in either configuration and then, you know, it could have an entirely different identity and could have an entirely set, entirely different set of capabilities. So purely based on what the device feels like uh, being able to do right now. And this is largely transparent to the user, right? I mean, I bet the, that the number of people who have dealt or needed to deal with this sort of level of detail with their USB devices, uh, that the number is fairly low because, I mean, well, you expect that it just works. Right? You don't want to deal with any of that. And it's a um, fairly compact representation also, so this is um, just to show that they have really thought about uh, using all the space and as few bytes as possible to, you know, again, be cheap and use fewer, well, bytes, use less time to do the transfers, use less memory to do everything. So USB, USB being cheap is arguably one reason why well, the device can claim the identity itself, why operating systems need to support each and everything, and why we now have to deal with this well, problem of my pen drive identifying as a keyboard. So, as we've seen, the attack surface is rather large. So, in fact, uh, most drivers live in kernel space, and although you may have locked your session, and, uh, you know, we're here in, on a conference, it, it happens that I leave my machine somewhere and go to the toilet or talk to people or get drunk, and then, you know, someone with physical access to the machine and the USB interfaces, they could circumvent whatever protection mechanism I have in place. Funnily enough, in security circles, it's often assumed that once you have physical access, then you're lost anyway. And that, I think that's true, but only so much. Like, we do have, like we as in GNOME, we do provide protection against, like, an attacker with physical access. The most prominent, I'd say, is the lock screen. I mean, we have password protection in place, right? Why do we have that if we do not want to prevent, uh, well, an attack based on someone sitting in front of the computer? So what if we could extend that protection like this, you know, abstract protection, the, the user is not on the machine, like, it's not the user who's on the machine, we don't want anything, like, bad to happen to the machine. And it should only be the user himself or themselves that decides on what happens to the machine, whether it's good or bad. So this is the, the mental abstraction that I'm, that I'm having. We're, we have a detector for the presence of the user, which is the lock screen, and our intention as operating system is to, well, protect the machine as good as possible, to, to protect the integrity of the data of the user as good as we can while the user is not present. So most USB drivers as of today live in kernel space. That makes it a really interesting target for the attacker because, well, it's the crown jewels of your, op of your computing. If you get into the kernel, then you can effectively do pretty much whatever you want. And yes, there is user space drivers, but I mean, compared to the number of drivers in kernel space, that's still the minority. And turns out that USB was very, was designed as being very flexible, so you could more or less interact with every driver there is uh, in Linux. It turns out like there's many drivers in Linux and on your standard, you know, Fedora, Ubuntu, whatever, they ship all the drivers, you know, everything. Although you may never need a, say, MIDI keyboard, you have drivers for those on your machine. And let's just imagine that there is a bug in this MIDI keyboard driver and, uh, well, you, you enable an, att an attacker to interface with that driver. And yes, that's a real story. Like last year, there was this bug in this USB MIDI, well, it was a MIDI keyboard, right? Like something. And it allowed people to, you know, hijack your computer. And you probably have no interest whatsoever in supporting MIDI keyboards for your machine because, you know, it's your travel laptop. There's no reason why you would ever plug a MIDI keyboard in. Yet, you're gonna be owned this way. Like some, somebody will plug this device in that hijacks your computer based on that vulnerability of that driver from 20 years ago that never, that, that had no eyeballs within the last 20 years. Yeah, so there's um, a lot of USB, uh, say, known vul vulnerabilities. I found it funny when I looked it up yesterday, uh, the first thing was this Boeing 777, you know, like uh, what could possibly go wrong in an airplane? And just two or three items below was another very uh, high profile, say, product. Yeah, and that was quite scary. So I think we have, I hope to have convinced you that we have, you know, a bit of a problem at our hands and that we ought to deal with that problem somehow.
And you might say, well, uh, that's just an aside because I, th I thought it was funny because uh, when you think USB, you may like uh, think of physical presence and pretty much rightfully so, but of course someone came up with you know bridging USB via network. So there's actually uh, an IP-based USB um, standard, say, so you can you know have uh, internet-based USB, like the real protocol over the internet or IP to be precise. And there's a wireless version which uses their own sort of proprietary wireless protocol. So your attack surface may not, you know, it, it may be larger than the, the physical dimensions of your laptop. You know, it may be uh, wireless or over the internet even. So as, um, as a last, last part, people, as I've mentioned, expect it to just work. They expect to just plug it in and to have it work. USB is, um, was, was designed to be fairly flexible. There's all these, um, well, there's the notion of classes so that you have one common driver in the operating system and it works with a range of devices of the same class. So keyboards, for example, there's um, people found out that it's silly to have uh, like a, a dedicated driver for each and every keyboard in existence. And they figured that, much, that it'd be much smarter to have only one driver. And there's quite a few of these generic drivers, well, because people expect it to just work, like they, you know, just plug it in. So we have to, I'm, I'm, we mentioned that because that's what we have to deal with. If we ever want to protect against uh, rogue USB devices, then we must take into account that the user rightfully expects it to just work. And this is a bit of a challenge because how do you, you know, how do you know that the keyboard that has now been attached is not actually the user's keyboard, but is, you know, hidden in this pen drive masquerade. So we can, whatever we, we come up with, it, there, there will be cases that, well, either block too much or block too little because we, we cannot easily tell whether, you know, a device is benign or malicious. So we have to make decisions. We need to be opinionated about what we do. And our opinion so far is we should increase the protection level without modifying the existing uh, behavior of the system. So we try to, to turn the knob of protection, like we turn it to more protection for as much as we don't change the current user experience. And I think we can still, you know, be better than we currently do. For example, the lock screen thing, we would expect the machine to sort of be more protected when it's locked. And I think we can exploit this mental, uh, say, uh, this expectation that the machine is better protected when it's locked. So, yes, people expect it to work. We will need to make decisions, and some people will be grumpy when, you know, we make those decisions. But, again, we argue that it's, uh, that it will be fine. Anyway, um, other people have thought about the problem, and I'll hand over to Ludovico, who knows much better in this, uh, like, um, in this area. And when I say we worked on this subject, then I mean Ludovico because he did most of the work. And he's a very, very talented young man, and I'm happy to have worked with him. I ha hope he will stick around you know, for a long time. And let's welcome Ludovico. Thank you. So um, other people, uh, not in Linux uh, uh, environment, but also outside of Linux, uh, um, already tried to do some uh, some kind of protection for USB devices. And, uh, for example, uh, we have this uh, uh, hardware um, locking uh, for your USB port, where you can actually physically block a USB port. It's uh, quite drastically, but... Uh, it's very secure. It, <laughs> it did the trick. And uh, you can also, for example, lock your... Uh, uh, USB port via software and uh, you need to uh, issue this command at uh, the bottom of the slide. It's uh, clearly not that uh, user-friendly to do, but uh, uh, it's there and it's doable. And so if a user is really uh, willing to protect them himself, uh, there are ways to do it. And uh, on Windows, for example, uh, Kaspersky, um, offer this kind of protection where when you plug a new device uh, you need to enter a pin that is generated every time 
it's random and uh, so uh, the new inserted device will not work until you type this pin that you will see on your screen in this pop-up. Um, on Linux we have uh, USB guard that it's uh, arguably the most famous uh, um, software to uh, add USB protection to your system and uh, this uh, were the official uh, Qt applet and um, as of three months ago uh, it has been dropped from the latest release so it was the official applet but right now it's no more uh, right now if you install USB guard you don't get uh, UI at all and um, you can argue that uh, it was not that uh, user friendly and uh, you had a lot of options where you can from which you can choose uh, about your protection and uh, a lot of strings strange uh, serials numbers and so on for every USB port that you have in your system and uh, also when you plug a new USB device you get this uh, pop up at the right and um, it will inform you it's a uh, dialogue where you need to choose if you want to allow or block your new inserted USB device and you have uh, around 20 seconds to do the decision based on the uh, character that you see in the serial uh, uh, of this pop up and uh, some numbers uh, below and uh, you need to do this, uh, make this decision quickly, and uh, if you don't respond, that uh, you will never know what will happen to your USB device. So you are there in a hurry to make this decision, and also you can make it permanent. And uh, uh, probably it will be harder for the user to undo this decision because you will never know where to go uh, to undo this decision. I, I, so this is the. I think this is the pinnacle of how to do bad UX. I mean, it, I think pretty much everything about this is wrong. Like when I go somewhere and do the, do the sort of regular GNOME talk, and I like, uh, well, first of all, we don't interrupt the user because the user's like in the way of doing something. Like we, we don't want to get in the user's way. Then they make the decision quickly, and there's this permanency button, and, sorry, there's this, uh, this permanency button, and I mean, there's no way a user can make this decision correctly in you know a couple of seconds while doing their work, while being interrupted now by GNOME. Nothing works, and then there's this pop-up. You hit this checkbox maybe, and then you have no way of ever undoing this. So if you happen to write UIs, do not ever make a security decision permanent from that whatever interruption you do. Yeah, and I mean that was just plain bad. Also, it's so funny because that was, <laughs> it was actually it allowed markup. So your, if your device name you know had like a markup, HTML markup, then would be interpreted by this cute thing. So you could, you know, have, <laughs> it's so bad. Like everything is bad about this. And so it's, well, but we're here to make things better, right? And on, on top of that, the, uh, to open this uh, uh, applet, you needed to double click the icon in the uh, app, uh, in the um, icon in the top right of your system. And uh, that's even, uh, not enabled by default on GNOME, you need to install an extension to see this icon at all. So if you don't have an extension, then you install this applet and you're not even able to open it. So um, we as in GNOME um, uh, did this uh, more integrated uh, uh, USB guard uh, interface. Uh, it uh, has been developed maybe like three years ago, four. And um, um, it's uh, like uh, written in uh, GT GTK, and um, you still get the list of devices that you are currently you currently have in your system, all the hubs, and uh, you have this kind of pop-up still uh, where you get the status of your uh, device, and you can enable and disable them. And when you plug a new device, you get the notification of a new device inserted, and you still need to make the choice to allow or block this new device. And um, for example, if you don't act quickly um, allowing or blocking this device, the notification will go away. And if you 
bring this notification back from the uh, notification history in GNOME, you will not get this allow and block um, uh, buttons, so you will not be able to allow the device. So uh, now that uh, we presented all these uh, uh, protections that uh, are, are already available, uh, the question is why we started this project at all. And uh, well, there were people that uh, were willing to increase the uh, USB protection in their system. So the most logical thing was installing USB guard in their system. And uh, that's what happened to them. Uh, these are a few screenshots of uh, angry users about uh, their unusable system. Uh, the installed USB guard and uh, everything stopped working because uh, every USB ports uh, were blocked so it was a uh, complete uh, protection but probably not what they were expecting and uh, so they were literally uh, locked out from their system and uh, well we uh, even this poor guy with his recovery thing there in the middle, right? He tried to probably to control Alt F2 or something to go to channel. Yeah, yeah, he was even blocked by the recovery. The most uh, common solution to this is uh, booting from uh, a live, uh, live CD, live USB, and uh, mount your system and uh, change the protection level because the, by default it's everything is blocked. So yeah, not we can't. Uh, we can't say that that's user friendly at all. So um, this is a quote uh, that uh, pretty much sums what we are doing, and it's uh, security at expense of usability comes at the expense of security. Um, if the security is too much, then uh, nobody will use it, and uh, that's like not having the security at all. So. Um, our protection um, is based on uh, USB guard, uh, and uh, we tried so hard to not break the current uh, workflow behavior of the, our users. And um, in this way, we want to be as transparent as possible so that uh, the protection is on, but the user will uh, nearly uh, not even notice that it's enabled. And, uh, so they can continue to do their work as always, but they are also uh, more protected. And um, so to achieve that, we tried with a, sm with a small uh, set of protections and then we tried to grow from it step by step um, so that uh, we still maintain the um, not intrusive approach. Uh, we did an iterative design and uh, we started with a simple on and off uh, switch and that was uh, like uh, enable every USB ports and disable everything. And um, by disable everything it was disable every new devices, not the devices that were already connected. Um, the lock screen protection, that's um, when we block the new devices when your lock screen is enabled. And the keyboard protection, it's um, when, uh, for example, we wanted to block uh, uh, attacks from like this type of uh, USB devices. And uh, then, uh, for example, the next step will be a protection also when the screen is uh, unlocked. So every time you plug something, you have some kind of protection. Um, this is our current design. It's, uh, this is GNOME Control Center and uh, we had this uh, disallow new USB devices uh, in the privacy tab. And uh, in this um, um, new entry you get this uh, dialog. And this is an early design when, where we uh, gave the user the option to block new devices when the lock screen was locked or um, always block new USB devices even when the session was unlocked. And uh, this is uh, 
just a video of how it worked. It was also with the on and off protection below, uh, on top. And um, this was uh, uh, binded to having USB guard in your system. So, for example, if you don't have a working USB guard, you will not be able to uh, enable the USB protection. And this is how it works uh, in the current design. We drop the, um, the lever protection from the uh, Gnome Control Center um, because for the average user, um, having a, um, always block new devices even when the session was unlocked was uh, not that useful because, for example, you could have, if you have physical access to an unlocked Gnome uh, instance, you can just open Gnome Control Center and uh, change the USB protection. And uh, also, um, um, for example, it's uh, probably not what a user expects to have, uh, never uh, allow new USB devices, but we still offer this protection and uh, only you need to set it in the uh, deconf. And, um, because, for example, it can be useful for uh, if you have a GNOME instance uh, in a kiosk or something like that, where you just have uh, uh, an application in full screen and uh, you don't want, you don't expect uh, a user to plug something in your system. So you just block every new devices in in, uh, in this computer. And so by default, this on and off it's the lock screen protection. So if you turn it on. Uh, when your screen is locked, uh, you can plug new USB devices. There is still a trick, and uh, that's about the keyboards, because uh, uh, we can't just uh, block every new devices when the screen is locked, uh, because, for example, if your keyboard, your main keyboard breaks, you plug your, they're plugging you a new keyboard, but it will not work, because the protection is on, so you are pretty much out of uh, your system, you, you can't log in anymore. So what we did, it's uh, still allowing keyboards when the protection is on. And um, instead, when we allow a keyboard, we show this uh, notification, uh, the first one, that says that uh, we allow the new keyboard. And uh, so if the user didn't plug a keyboard, you need to check your system because probably some, there is some suspicious device. And um, um, if you, the screen, the protection is on and you plug another type of device, uh, it will get blocked and it's the second uh, notification. It's, uh, it informed the user that a new device has been uh, detected and uh, that it, it's, uh, it has been blocked. So you need to unlock your session and then uh, unplug and replug your device to get it working. We did a GNOME shell integration, and um, so we show a notification, uh, an icon, when uh, the protection is enabled, and this is still not sure if uh, this will ever uh, land, because uh, we are still under discussion if we want to show uh, an icon for that uh, or not. So right now, this is the um, work in progress about it, and uh, we will see if uh, we will ever have this uh, kind of uh, icon or not. And uh, so with this uh, pro uh, kind of protection that I presented to you, um, we are still not uh, um, uh, protecting our users from attacks like the one that we show uh, at the beginning of this talk and uh, because the session will be unlocked and you plug um, some malicious devices and uh, it will start to type things in your computer and uh, we are not covering that with the protection that I show you a few minutes ago. So uh, to Allow also this type of protection, we added a second type of uh, 
uh, second stage, we can, we can say, of protection. And that's uh, the type of protection that we have when also when the session is unlocked and it's uh, tar targeting uh, US, uh, keyboard devices. So um, it was, of course, uh, um, it's easy to allow or block a device, but it's hard to know if a device is uh, malicious or not. So it's hard to uh, selectively uh, understand uh, if uh, we need to block a device because it's suspicious or if it's just a device that the user wants to use and we don't want to get in uh, the user way. So this is the work in progress of what we have, we have right now. It's, um, uh, this is still a GNOME control center and uh, that's a new tab in uh, uh, the device uh, uh, tab of the uh, GNOME control center. And we have this uh, use keyboard protection. And uh, what it does, it's uh, when you enable the keyboard protection, you plug a new keyboard the keyboard will be limited. That means that uh, every time you, um, ev the keyboard will work as expected, but we block the uh, potentially dangerous keys like control, alt, the functional keys. So, um, for example, this type of attack will, will never, will not work because we can't uh, do the alt F2 to open uh, uh, the run command and uh, open a browser. And uh, that's the kind of protection that, for example, uh, you want for, uh, uh, I don't know, your main keyboard breaks, you plug a new one, and uh, because your, all, all your um, um, alphabet will work, your keys, so you can still like type your password, you can still uh, uh, get access to your system, and then if the keyboard is the is a trusted one. You can go to the Chrome Control Center and uh, fully allow this keyboard. Um, for example, also, I I have a mouse. For example, that it's a gaming mouse and it's uh, shown as a keyboard. Also, uh, probably you don't trust that much your mouse uh, being able to work as a keyboard too. So you can leave, for example, your mouse as a limited device. So uh, it will not uh, do some sketchy things in your system. So um, all this uh, uh, type of protections that I show you, it's, uh, they, they are all in a merge request right now. And uh, we are waiting for comments uh, or uh, code review. So if you're interested, you, you can have a look and uh, leave a comment or a review or, yeah, we are open to every kind of uh, feedback. Uh, thank you very much. I like to thank the Gnome Foundation to uh, sponsor this because they have sponsored this uh, project and in Collabora for allowing me to attend this conference. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Uh, when do you expect it to be landing in, uh, in GNOME, like next cycle? Or? Uh, probably we will not be ready for the 340, so uh, I expect to be the next one, so in like six months, because we are not ready for this uh, uh, release right now. Right, so this, it'd be it'd be very good if we could land like this first sort of iteration for the next for, for the first unstable release, so that distributions have a lot of time to check it out because it's very uh, it's very quirky. Like the the USB guard underneath is very how to put it. It's very opinionated, and it didn't expect to be controlled from the outside, so from a session, like not directly from the user by way of rule files and so on, but by some you know, automated way. And um, that makes it a bit um, quirky, and I think it needs some time to, you know, for, for all the bugs to be shaken out. So I hope, I, I really wish that we can 
land this first iteration or this the very first version in the uh, first point release of the unstable series, and then hopefully it'll land next time. It depends a little bit on reviewers like pencil in front. Uh, I think you need to push the button. Push the button, uh, but that you need to Mac push didn't it work. So I think the GSD side is actually uh, mergeable right now, so we can merge it as soon as we have branched, I think. Um, there's some control center comments that I did, so we might want to, I'm not sure, I mean, it might, it might make sense to merge the control center stuff together with the GNOME settings daemon stuff, so yeah, that people so, can so actually a, control it. So there's a, a sort of hierarchy involved, right? We first need the schemas, then we need the settings daemon, yeah. and it, like there's a, sort of, it trickles down, because we, we had it to touch a few modules, like four or so, and it needs to like fall into place in the right order, otherwise it breaks builds and so on. But I think like it's mostly there, so, um, yeah, there is good chances that we can merge it early in the cycle. Well, I think whatever will be merged first will probably not be whatever will be released then half a year later because I think we will go through a few, say, design revisions at least, like from the visual appearance because, well, as we've shown, the notification thingy, for example, is not entirely, you know, set yet. And on our side, we were... Um, because we had this iterative design of coming from, off, coming from on off first and then, like building up our, our story, we had um, some cruft from the early cycles and then we, we still had this, what Ludovico showed, the on-off button, for example. Turns out that it was needed and I think we will find more of these things that we simply didn't see and that only come from review so, and testing, so please go ahead and, uh, you know, try it out. Bob. Uh, I'm not uh, familiar with this USB guide. Does that need uh, kernel support? Well, yes and no. I mean, yes, because obviously something needs to talk, you know, issue the hardware commands in order you know, to in further pursue communication with the device. But it's been there, like, since, God, 2007. So, so I mean, so, what, like the, so to inhibit a USB device, uh, presumably that needs specific... Inhi inhibition support in the kernel. So is that like, presumably that's mainline, and uh, I get, and the, uh, the underlying question is how, how is that enabled? Is it enabled by default? Oh, is it? Uh, it's all there. It's, it's been there since like a decade. It's all right. there, like ready to go. Okay. Yeah, no. the only thing that changed relatively recently was, um, but that's maybe too detailed. Like, the USB devices have certain, can have a number of interfaces. You know, his mouse can have the mouse interface as well as the keyboard interface. And Linux, initially in 2007, Linux was not capable of enabling single interfaces. And nowadays you can enable single interfaces. That is not to say that USB guard cannot do it yet. But, I mean, it's as simple as writing a one to file somewhere in sys, proc, bus, whatever. And actually to the point that we were thinking of just doing it ourselves, man. I mean, it's not that complicated to write a one into a file on the system. And the pain that USB God has given us led me to thinking that we may have been better off doing it ourselves simply. But I mean, that ship has sailed now. We go with USB Guard, and you know, it's delegating responsibility to that type of thing is also feels very good, like not having to maintain it yourself and so on. Um, so you're still using USB Guard, right? Yeah. And we learned that USB Guard had huge issues with installation on, on Ubuntu, for example. So, um, will we need to rely on GDM starting up, for example, with GSD and, and inserting the correct rules so that people don't break their system and might we get issues in early boot? Or will distributions need to patch USB guard to avoid these kind of issues? What's the status with regard to that of preventing breaking systems accidentally or non-GNOME sessions or something like that? Probably it's a distribution thing. Uh, they should because by default USB guard has this really really strict rule and is expecting the user to manually edit the configuration before starting USB guard. Um, probably uh, distributions like Ubuntu need to uh, edit this configuration before the installation to allow a more uh, uh, relaxed rules where. Uh, E, your already plugged device will not get blocked by default and so the users will not be locked out of their system and uh, yeah I think that I mean this uh, uh, this point has been raised also to the USB guard maintainer but uh, 
probably uh, that's uh, how the things will continue to to be he is not uh, willing to change the defaults well yeah yes that is to say we try very hard to not break the system right and um, we go to the point that we manipulate the rule file so that it like allows everything by default and in case we crash because that's the other problem if we crash like if the session crashes then we wouldn't you know want to leave the user out of being able to recover their system so we, we try really hard we've thought about a lot of edge cases uh, to not break the system in that sort of constellation and i think we're good yes there may be the, the occasional case like the fringe case that we haven't thought of but i don't think um that should be too common. As for early boot, because you asked about early boot, early boot is in so far not an issue as that by default Linux enables devices unless you manually, you know, disable Linux from doing so or prevent Linux from doing so. And uh, the daemon is not set up, it's not started, right? So uh, as soon as the USB guard starts up, it would disable yeah. automatic authorization of devices. So. That makes me think, uh, could we just debus activate USB guard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a funny thing because it happens and that breaks users' machines. Because, you know, they haven't started USB guard themselves, but of course it gets activated. And I think Debian even starts it by default because when Debian installs demons, it just starts them. Oh, it, it got activated because um, it, all these screenshots that I show, for example, um, a few of them, uh, the issue was caused, caused by USB guard, the applet of USB guard, because when you install the USB guard and also the applet, then the applet will start the daemon with, from Dbus, and so you still haven't uh, modified the configuration of USB guard, but it's already started by the, the applet, and uh, you are locked out of your system, from your system. Right, so we could um, tell distributions to use Dbus activation for USB guard to protect non-GNOME sessions, somewhat, maybe. But I guess they should probably just ship a different default configuration and yeah, patch the you, you, upstream. If values. you don't write rules for USB guard, you don't get anything. You, you, get, you either get the full blocking or nothing, like no blocking at all. And you know, you need someone to actively manage this USB guard thing. And blindly activating it results in, as we've seen, you know, the user not being able to plug in any device. Distributions can do that. I mean, they do that right now. It's the default. I mean, if you install USB guard, the default is, you know, block everything. And I understand them. I don't want to blame them. If I was writing USB guard, I would do it the same way. I would, you know, not want to be responsible for accident, accidental, you know, uh, attacks on machines because my, my defaults were too relaxed and I want the users to make active decisions. It's not a position we can have in GNOME, though. And in GNOME, we need to be more opinionated because we have real users that want to use the machines and want to be productive. So um, yeah, we, I, I mean, we will need to figure out with the distributions what the, what behavior we expect. I think we're good though with the way we're doing it in terms of manipulating the rules in that we allow everything. Like, frankly, if we start up as GNOME, we detect USB guard is running, we detect that it's not configured to our liking, then we overwrite the configuration. It's, uh, it's a bit mean towards these people who have manually like, configured USB guard already. But uh, again, we try to be very gentle. So we append the rules, not prepend. You know, they, the rules are in order. And if we detect rules, but it's not ours, then we append our allow everything rule. So again, we, we try really hard like, to you know, not be obnoxious with uh, like breaking users' expected behavior. And we even try to find out whether the user has installed USB guard manually and configured USB guard manually and then even try to be nice with them, with those people. And uh, like if all that fails for you, you can simply flick the uh, configuration in deconf and you know, nothing, we not gonna touch any, any of your configuration. No. Question. Um, yeah. This is uh, maybe only partially uh, related, but I just wanted to uh, share a, a story I had with an unworking USB device that maybe or may not fall into a potential edge case. Uh, so I had uh, one case where I had uh, locked my computer and then subsequently spilled uh, water on the keyboard. And then I couldn't write my password because the left side of the keyboard didn't respond to my input. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> no, it was this one. I have a new keyboard on it now, so it's good. But then I had to change my password to only work on the right side <laughs> of the keyboard so I could use my computer. Um, I don't think uh, the reason to why I wanted to be in this talk was I was like, hmm, are you doing anything like blocking things while you're at the lock screen and then if I accidentally spill my water on the keyboard and I can't. But I think the rules sound pretty relaxed, so... Yeah, yeah, that's that's the falls under the case where we allow new keyboards even if the screen is locked. So that's exactly to cover this kind of cases where your keyboard breaks and uh, either way you are out of your system and you can plug anything more. Um, how does USB guard um, behaves if you plug in? Um like you are allowed, like you you can press allow or deny, right? This is what you had a couple of times in the slides. Um, what happens if you plug in the same device over and over again? Like you, you remove it, you plug it in again. Do you have to every time allow it again, or do you remember what you that you already like um, basically whitelisted that device? So the kind of allow block, it's. Um uh, so the notification one that we show uh, before, that's the USB guard GNOME, that it's a different project uh, that was already in place. Um, for um, uh, devices, like uh, normal device, when you plug your device, it, it will work just fine. For uh, the second type of protection, the, the last one that we show um, was the... Sorry, ah, okay, no problem. Um, where you have the keyboard and we full um, allow a keyboard or it's limited and, mm -hmm. it's, and that's where you uh, do the decision where you want to allow also the malicious, potentially malicious keys, dangerous keys and so on. Um, when you do this decision we save the um, the decision that you made so if it's uh, fully authorized or not and in a local database and uh, so when you replug your keyboard, uh, it will be authorized by default and you don't need to do, make this decision again every time. But just to clarify, I mean, the, these interaction things that we, we've seen, these were not us, right? This USB card GNOME especially, there's, that's a side project of a friend of mine. <laughs> we try to have as few interaction points as possible. Like we think we can increase the protection level still without changing the UX in any way. Of course, we need, have to, we need to have interaction points, but we're trying to have as few of those as possible. Yes, I, I got that. And um, how, how do you identify um, a keyboard? What do you say about that specific keyboard? Uh, what we can get from the USB. So it's the name, uh, the vendor, the ID, and uh, like nothing more. That's the uh, kind of data that we can gather from a USB device. It's all we can get. And yes, this is unauthenticated. And yes, if your attacker knows, you know, this data of your keyboard, then yes, the attacker can produce the very same keyboard. Yes. We are entirely aware of that. Again, we are not trying to, you know, uh, have protection at any price. We're trying to increase the, attraction, uh, the, the protection level without, you know, reducing any of the usability. And I think it's a fair compromise to make. We don't have any other data. We need to work with what we have. We're out of time. We're out of time. Thank you very much.